Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Weatherspoon Distinguished Faculty Scholar Lecture Series. My name is Jim Dean. I'm the Dean of the Keenan Flagler Business School. Uh, as you may know, this annual lecture has become one of the most anticipated events of the year. Uh, it was created with a gift to the school from the Weatherspoon family to provide lectures by outstanding visiting scholars and world leaders from the fields of politics, education, business, and government. The purpose of the lecture series is to enrich the professional lives of the members of the community and to promote discussion. Before I introduce this evening's distinguished speaker, I'd like to remind you of our next Dean's Speaker event, which is on Monday, February 27th. And we will welcome that evening Jim Clifton, who is the CEO of Gallup. And I invite you all to join us for that lecture, which should be particularly topical given this political season that we're in right now. <laughs> and it seems like we've been in for 20 years, but <laughs> it actually doesn't say that on the script. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a number of special guests who are here with us tonight. Uh, Chancellor Holden Thorpe and his wife Patty are here with us this evening. Chancellor Emeritus Bill McCoy and his wife Sarah. Former UNC Keenan Flagler Dean Jack Evans and his wife Pat. Former UNC Athletic Director Dick Bedore and wife Linda. Thank you all for being here with us this evening. Tonight we are honored to welcome Ambassador Zalme Khalilzad to UNC Keenan Flagler. Ambassador Khalilzad has earned broad respect throughout the world for his record in the most turbulent areas, areas of US foreign policy. Serving as the 26th UN, US Ambassador to the United Nations, he dealt with extraordinary global issues during one of the most challenging periods in US history, including the Russia-Georgia conflict and the Mumbai terrorist attacks. Previously, he served as US ambassador to both Iraq and Afghanistan, where he played a significant role in facilitating both countries' constitutions. This evening, he will speak to us on Iran, Afghanistan, and the Middle East, challenges and opportunities. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest speaker, Ambassador Zalmi Khalilzad. First of all, I want to make sure that the mic is on. It is. Thank you. I did OK. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dean, uh, for that kind introduction. I want to thank the Weatherspoons for their uh, generosity to make this uh, visit possible. Thank you. I want to thank all other distinguished visitors uh, who are here that you named. Uh, and. Of course, I want to thank the audience, too, uh, for uh, your presence here. As the dean said, the topic uh, of discussion tonight is uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and Iran, and the Middle East. But uh, I'd like to put the, the discussion of this uh, region uh, in a broader context by making uh, a few points in, uh, with regard to the strategic context in which uh, we uh, should think uh, about this area. First is that uh, we are uh, in an era where uh, the U.S. role in the world, uh, because we've had a very substantial role, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan, is uh, going through a transition. And therefore, where we come out uh, ourselves in terms of uh, U.S. Uh, strategic role in that part of the world will have an impact on how the region evolves and in turn how the region will, 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 will uh, impact us. Uh, as I go around the countries uh, uh, and speak, there is no question that uh, because of the significant economic problems that uh, uh, the country faces, uh, because of the experience uh, of the last decade with Iraq and Afghanistan in particular, uh, th there is a, a, a strong propensity for uh, focusing internally and uh, disengaging or, or lessening uh, the role that the United States is playing in the world. 
Uh, that is obviously the political response to the current crisis. But at the same time, I believe uh, in terms of global trends, that too has its impact on the U.S. role. Uh, at the present time, uh, uh, given the rate of growth in the U.S. economy, uh, and, and given the rate of growth in the economies of some of the other key players, uh, the balance of power is beginning to adjust. Although we remain uh, the most uh, important power in the world in terms of the size of the U.S. economy, in terms of the military capabilities of the United States, it's unparalleled. Uh, 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 in terms of our uh, societal relations, uh, with other societies and the technology that the society is producing uh, impacting the world uh, in terms of our, the role of some of our institutions, particularly educational institutions, uh, with all the problems we've had with visas and difficulties of students to come from some part of the world, which has been, in my view, uh, uh, not altogether positive. Uh, 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 nevertheless, other powers are rising and if this, the current trend in terms of stagnation or slow growth in the U.S. and the significant growth in the rest of the world over a, an extended period of time, should these trends continue, will end up probably in, 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 a, in, a, in a situation which would be similar to a multipolar or ba a balance of power system of multiple players competing and cooperating uh, and, 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 and that competition in an earlier period shaped the Middle East that uh, those of us who have played a role in recent times uh, inherited. Uh, but uh, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, it will be different, uh, clearly. It, it will not be exactly the same as it was the last time when multiple global players competed and cooperated. But it will, have, it will be different than the last decade in which we were uniquely dominant in shaping the future of this region. And, 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 and it, it will mean a more complicated, a more complex uh, 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 set of circumstances uh, for all of the players, uh, and for us in particular, because we are used to being a much more preeminent uh, uh, to adjust to, to, uh, uh, to an orchestrating role uh, 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 more players to be orchestrated to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to do things or not to do things than deciding and leading always uh, by ourselves or only the coalition of the willing uh, 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 as we did. So that that's one shaping factor. The second uh, shaping factor that I want to mention uh, very briefly is the rise of several powers in particular that affect this region. Uh, uh, two are local powers, uh, because as the U.S. role recedes or uh, diminishes, uh, uh, Turkey and Iran have um, uh, emerged as the preeminent local powers to shape uh, the Middle East part, uh, the Arab part, Israel, of course, is very important, but it is not as significant a player in the day-to-day -day, uh, maneuverings to shape this region uh, uh, as these two powers are. And uh, over the last decade, the rise of Turkey in particular is, 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 is uh, very significant, uh, uh, where on all key regional issues, uh, Turkey's uh, role uh, is very significant, and, and uh, Iran uh, also has emerged as an important player. Uh, the Arab Spring, uh, that we'll talk a little bit more about uh, uh, later, has empowered Islamist movements uh, 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 throughout uh, the region. And uh, these Islamist movements are for the most part, Sunni uh, uh, sect forces. Islam has two main sects. Those of you who know Islam, you all know Shia and Sunni. 
And the Iranian revolution empowered, as an Islamist movement, the Shia uh, political forces, because Iran, uh, to separate itself uh, from the rest of the Muslim world at that time in the Middle East, which was Ottoman, Sunni, embraced Shia Islam to distinguish itself, to separate itself from the rest. But now what you have is really a return to almost uh, uh, the 19th century, the Ottomans and the Safavids, the Safavid being the ruling family during the dynasty of Iran, the Ottomans uh, in Turkey have returned uh, as players that shaped the region. As Sunni Islam is a, a party that, that is the ruling party of, of Turkey, uh, this Turkey that's growing economically, although it has, its economy has weaknesses, but it's growing and is becoming diplomatically very engaged, uh, is competing for, uh, for uh, preeminence in this area. And, 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 and you can see that in particular in Iraq, where the two now with the US departure has become much more uh, significant in shaping the future of Iraq, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. But these are issues, the big issues to keep in mind, uh, the uh, struggle for the future of Islam between these two uh, powerful forces uh, that shape uh, that area. The third thing uh, that to keep in mind, uh, and that's very important, is the uh, role of U.S. and its relations with Pakistan. Another shaping factor, uh, and we'll talk about it in detail with regard to Afghanistan in particular. The United States has had a very close relationship with Pakistan historically, uh, as well as at times it has had a, not such a close relationship with it. Right now we are in a, in a period of, of, of crisis in the relationship uh, between uh, the two countries. And what happens to this relationship, which includes uh, the issue of Afghanistan, because we are on two different sides of the Afghan struggle. We support the government, they support uh, the uh, insurgency against the government. We assist them, provide the military and economic assistance. They give us access for our aircraft to fly over their territory to go after targets. Uh, they allow and disallow access to their port and across their territory to resupply the troops. Uh, they assist us sometimes in counter-terror operations, at other times they oppose us. It is one of the most complicated and the most difficult relationship uh, you can imagine. I just give you a few examples of, uh, 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 of it. And Pakistan's civil institutions, its political institutions, economic institutions are under huge stress. It's not performing as the Arab systems were not performing, that uh, uh, was one of the, if not the reason for why uh, uh, the Arab Spring uh, 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 was produced. Uh, here, uh, the key determinants of where Pakistan goes besides the, pop, the public that one doesn't know, or we believe always that ultimately the people decide, but in fact, you know, at what rate they decide is it going to be a decision in two years or 10 or 20 or 100? In part, depends on the institutions uh, that are governing and their performance uh, and their ability to keep the people uh, satisfied enough uh, that it will allow them to continue to rule. And that is the role of the, the, role of the Pakistani institutions, uh, uh, and particularly its military institutions, will be very significant that I will come back to. But that has to be. That has to be kept in mind. Now with that sort of, where are we going as a country, the United States being the preeminent world power still, although with some relative decline, where is the rest of the world, the key powers that are rising, how are they gonna uh, uh, interact with each other and interact with this region? Where is this division within Islam between Shia and Sunni that now is represented by Turkey and, and Iran? Where, how is that gonna uh, work out? And where is Pakistan uh, going, and how do we uh, uh, relate to it, and how the world, in fact, relates to it? Uh, that's 180 million people with over 100 nuclear weapons, the fastest growing stockpile of nuclear weapons in the world right now, uh, with weak institutions, uh, uh, or, or, or things to keep in mind as I talk about this specific case of, of, of Iran 
uh, Afghanistan and, uh, uh, and the Arab Spring, uh, uh, with some concluding points. First, with regard to Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan had be, has been at a, a, a war of one kind or another for uh, 35 years or, or more. Uh, it, uh, the, the government there uh, the, was uh, ruled by a monarchy, was overthrown in 73. Uh, then in 78, 79, the Soviets came in. There was a, a war for almost 10 years. Then the various Afghan fighters, with, without help, uh, thrown out the Soviets, fought each other, uh, destroyed much of the country, the capital city, uh, produced uh, proportionally, perhaps the, uh, the largest refugee uh, population in the world, uh, at, one, at one point, uh, something like 25% of the population of Afghanistan were either internal or mostly external refugees, which meant mostly educated people, because those who, who can leave tend to leave first. Uh, those who have connections, who have knows, they know how to uh, uh, find their way they, uh, they, they, they left. And then the Taliban came uh, in the name of law and order, essentially, uh, but very draconian in their methods, very backward in their kind of vision uh, for where they wanted the country to go. And Al-Qaeda uh, was allowed to come in, uh, uh, became almost uh, like a state sponsoring a country. Al-Qaeda, usually you think there is a, a state sponsor of terrorism, terrorists, so that's how the State Department is to categorize countries. Here it was a terrorist group sponsoring a state uh, of Afghanistan, the Taliban, providing it with technical assistance, providing with financial assistance, providing it with military assistance because it was Al-Qaeda fighters or commanders that led some of the uh, Taliban forces assaulting anti-Taliban forces uh, in Afghanistan. After the overthrow, uh, the situation in Afghanistan, and I was uh, telling a group of students uh, earlier today, uh, was desperate. When I, uh, my plane, that, uh, the plane that took me uh, 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 to Kabul, uh, was the first plane to land in, in, in uh, the Kabul civilian airport uh, uh, after the overthrow of the Taliban. And I had to, uh, in the back of my plane, the C-130, uh, a huge number of satellite telephones, Swedish made, I remember uh, the orange, uh, big phones like this, uh, uh, to distribute to the government and the international community because they had, there was no phone system. Uh, uh, um, the entire Afghan income the year before, the state income was less than $200 million. You can imagine, uh, this university has obviously a bigger budget uh, than that. Uh, uh, this, for, this is a country of 27 million people. Uh, I think the uh, infant mortality, mother dying at childbirth was the worst I believe, in some parts of Afghanistan and the world. I think it was ranked just above Somalia, uh, if I'm not mistaken, from the bottom up. Uh, uh, so one, in, one had to, one took over, as Secretary Powell uh, 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 used to remind us, that you broke it, you own it, so to speak. So we had, in a sense, uh, had taken on uh, uh, the responsibility after the overthrow uh, of a very, very difficult, uh, uh, desperate uh, set of circumstances. And over the years, uh, there has been a, a significant achievement at the human level for the, uh, for the people of Afghanistan. Uh, now, uh, uh, there is 17 plus cell phone units uh, across Afghanistan, four cell companies, some uh, international, two local ones. Uh, life expectancy uh, has increased 
from 45 uh, year on average to 62 in the last uh, 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 10 years. Education from 900 boys going to school under the Taliban, no girls, uh, to 6.2 million, uh, over one third girls. Uh, with many institutions, educational institutions, including, I'm uh, happy to say, on a, an institution that I serve on the board of the American University of Afghanistan in Kabul, having 1,500 students uh, this year. And the infrastructure and, uh, 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 and so on. But when it comes to the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the future of the country in terms of its security, it remains very contingent. Uh, contingent on uh, a number of things. First, I mentioned Pakistan before. When uh, the Taliban were in power, Pakistan assisted the Taliban. It was one of the three countries, one of three countries that had recognized in the world the Taliban regime. Uh, it was uh, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the UAE, and the Pakistanis. And it took a huge threat uh, from the United States after 9-11 to tell the Pakistanis, you either abandon support for the Taliban or you will face the wrath of the United States. And we were in a very angry mood at that time, of course. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 and, 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 and President Musharraf, uh, if you've read his memoirs or if you've listened to him because he's been on the speaking circuit uh, in the United States, says that he looked at the uh, uh, Pakistani interest and weighed, do I go with the Taliban, do I go with the United States, kind of. And uh, he had a very practical calculation and based on that calculation he thought, we'll abandon uh, uh, the Taliban, allow the United States or support the United States to attack it if, if the Taliban decide not to turn over the Al-Qaeda uh, to the United States, which was the demand. The, 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 uh, you might not remember that the United States said to the Taliban, you have two choices. Either you turn over those who attacked us on 9-11, or we'll attack you. I mean, it was as simple as that, not very complicated. And, and, and uh, before uh, we were going to, 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 to carry out the attack, the U.S. Did, went, uh, did go to the U.N., got the U.N. mandate. There was a coalition, very broad, uh, participating. But from get-go, in my view, Pakistan believed, uh, or the security institutions of Pakistan believed, that the U.S. will not stay for the long term in Afghanistan, and that the U.S. would withdraw one day. Uh, and that there would be another play for Afghanistan. And they would like to have their own horses in that play. And they therefore hedged against a U.S. departure by sustaining and over time strengthening and supporting, arming and training uh, uh, the Taliban forces that had been defeated in the battlefield by the United States and some Afghans who, whose leadership ran away to Pakistan, those who were not captured or killed uh, took refuge to Pakistan. The same thing happened with, uh, with Al-Qaeda. Those who were not captured or killed in Afghanistan largely escaped to the uh, various parts of Pakistani territory. And one of the most difficult uh, issues that we have had to deal with uh, in the course of the last 10 years or so has been with all the assistance that we have provided, and uh, Pakistan got a substantial amount of assistance for its cooperation, because our planes were overflying Pakistani territory, and the troops were being resupplied through Pakistani ports and, and roads. There were Pakistani cooperation on and off again with regard to Al-Qaeda elements. We captured Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11 in Pakistan with Pakistani help, and quite a few others. We could not get Pakistan to totally side with us, not to also do the opposite, which is to help on the one hand and to work against it on the other by supporting the, 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 uh, the uh, opposition or by sheltering some terrorists, not doing all they could to, turn, uh, to find them and turn them over. Besides this hedging issue that I mentioned, some have argued that given the history of our interactions with Pakistan over the last 
60 or so years, that Pakistan, a scene when we need them, we pay a lot of attention to them, and they get assistance like they did during the Soviet war in Afghanistan. But when we don't need them, we forget them, and India is a much more lucrative uh, 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 a country, uh, important country, democracy, uh, a big economy, we, we, we become focused on India. And therefore, an additional reason perhaps besides hedging may be to keep this going for as long as you can because as long as it goes on, money and assistance keeps coming. So uh, you are both uh, uh, the cause or a contributor to the problem, and you're also the part of the solution to the problem that you have helped create, and therefore it can go on and on and on, and, uh, and, the, and the money can keep coming. Uh, it, the, Pakistan remains relevant, if you like, to, to, to important U.S. objectives. And I think that, uh, that uh, over the last several years, this issue, uh, 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 um, for a while, uh, has become much more, this recently become much more contentious in our relations. For a while, uh, we had uh, debates inside the administration whether really was the government of Pakistan doing both of these things or was it some uh, rogue elements inside the government that were doing the bad things or hiding or some people assisting the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Taliban. Uh, couldn't be President Musharraf, you know, he's such a good friend, you know, he comes to the White House, he, he says he's, he doesn't, he, 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 he doesn't uh, do these things. I used to complain from where I was in Kabul because where you set effects where you stand, as you know, and I get every morning these briefings about the attack here and the, how they came from across the border, so I would complain. Uh, to Washington, uh, uh, you know, we need to focus on this issue of the sanctuary in Pakistan. So one time President Bush finally got fed up with me and said, uh, uh, you raise this issue constantly, uh, and I raise it with President Musharraf, and he says he denies that he's doing any of the things that uh, I'm alleging, uh, based on reports that I get from my kind of military counterpart and from the intelligence uh, in the morning staff meetings. Uh, so he said, I'm going to do something for you. I said, what, Mr. President? He said, I'm going to call President Musharraf and tell him that you're coming to talk to him. Uh, <laughs> uh, the President of Pakistan. I said, uh, I'd be happy to, uh, to go. <laughs> so I, I ended up uh, having to go to see President Musharraf a few days later. And, uh, and the bottom line was this was a two uh, hours plus uh, conversation uh, with our ambassador to Pakistan. And, several military and intelligence people accompanying me, uh, we couldn't re uh, uh, get an agreement to agree on the facts. Uh, I was telling him, Mr. President, I would like to hear what your problems are with uh, uh, Afghanistan today, given that the United States is here in Afghanistan. I am there, and I, I, I think I could help bridge the difference or find solutions to the concerns that you have because we are unusually connected right now in Afghanistan with the new government. Uh, the people want peace. Uh, they were, they're tired. So if there are issues that bother you, uh, I really could help deal with this. But you tell me why you're doing what you're doing. And he, the whole thing became one of you saying, I'm not doing what uh, uh, this. Where? Taliban in Pakistan? Where are they? Give me their phone numbers, he will tell me. <laughs> Give me their street address. And I said, Mr. President, uh, 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 it's like uh, fish in a can. Uh, the, the leadership of Taliban, uh, they're, it's, it's, they're called the Quetta Shura. Quetta is a city in Pakistan. The, the, uh, the uh, journalists find them and interview them. They were on radio and television. Uh, and you're a nuclear power. Uh, you, you don't know what's going on in your country. You're asking me, the ambas poor ambassador of the United States with a neighboring country, to tell you the telephone number and, and the address of these guys. So it was an unproductive uh, interaction. <laughs> so, so uh, 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 and, 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 and therefore what happened was that uh, uh, for several years, the uh, US uh, almost uh, looked the other way, hoping 
that Pakistan will, will change its mind. We did even uh, some steps to discourage him from hedging by signing a strategic partnership agreement before I left for Iraq from Afghanistan uh, uh, with the uh, uh, Afghan government, United States and Afghanistan, to say, we're going to stay here for a, for, a, for a long time. We're not going. We ma made the mistake after the Soviet departure where we had been heavily involved with the Afghans to fight the Soviets and imposed a huge defeat on the Soviets in a country next door to them, much more uh, consequential than Vietnam was for us. Because Vietnam, after all, was 7,000 miles plus away from the shores of the United States. But Afghanistan was a neighboring state of the Soviet Union. And they had sent forces. And there was the Brezhnev Doctrine, those of you or a student of international relations or old enough to remember. It was a one-way street when the Soviets and neighboring state became socialist. It could not go back. Uh, if they decided to go back, force will come in. We saw it in Hungary. We saw it in the Czech Republic. We saw it in so many other places. So for the Afghans to, to, to force them out, it had to do obviously with Soviet weaknesses also, but the cost of Afghanistan was also a factor. And then we said, OK, thank you, and goodbye to the Afghans. And this chaos, in part, happened. So we weren't going to do that again. That's what uh, President Bush's commitment was. But that, too, uh, uh, was not sufficient, because they still believed that, no, we will leave one day, uh, that we, we, the United States was not going to stay. Now, of course, in terms of the uh, contingent uh, futures, is whether this current crisis was relations with Pakistan could lead both countries to think, uh, uh, particularly Pakistan, that it's gone too far. It's too costly because we're beginning to cut aid to them. Uh, uh, the military and uh, assistance that we provide. And we could find a formula. And I have uh, uh, written about this and I've talked to the Pakistani leaders. There are some legitimate Pakistani concerns in Afghanistan that could be accommodated in, in exchange for uh, a, a cooperation for a peace settlement in Afghanistan rather than fueling the insurgency. If that doesn't happen, if Pakistan persists in inflicting a defeat on us or forcing us to withdraw or waiting for us to withdraw, then take it over again uh, or have its friends take over the Taliban again, that's, that's option one is a negotiated settlement. And I don't believe that the talks in Qatar that we have started with the Taliban, which uh, uh, can produce effective results on the ground unless Pakistan buys into it. Because the insurgency is so dependent on Pakistan. It's like Viet Cong and North Vietnam, so to speak, that it would be very hard uh, for the insurgents as a whole, you could buy elements of the, uh, buy maybe too strong, you could rent elements of the insurgency uh, to cooperate with you on some issues. But for a decisive shift, a deal with, between the United States and Pakistan is, 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 is imperative. And right now, that doesn't look likely. So what we're doing is the option two is to strengthen the Afghan state, build its security institutions, harden it, so to speak, and for a US force to stay for a long period of time, but at a lower level, so the cost of Afghanistan can be more tolerable. Because right now, it's over 100 billion, not tolerable, indefinitely. So could one strengthen the Afghans enough? So they could, and could we break some parts of the insurgency away to join the government? So that a combination with a residual maybe 10 to 20,000 US presence at a much lower cost, this could go on until uh, the government wins or pa Pakistan changes uh, its, uh, its policy over time. That, uh, when it sees that we're not going to allow, uh, allow a, a total defeat of the Afghan side or our side in the conflict. That is kind of a favorable from the US uh, perspective outcome. Or a third is that, which people are counting on, that our domestic politics would lead us to a, 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 a withdrawal altogether. Uh, and 
letting, uh, even getting some kind of a bad agreement or, or a semi good agreement with the elements of the Taliban declaring victory, beginning to withdraw precipitously, or the Congress forcing a withdrawal through its power of the purse. And therefore, in that scenario, what would, what would uh, Iran do, which would, is not favorable uh, to the Taliban, although it's favorable to us suffering in Afghanistan? So it, would, it supports some elements of the Taliban, although they are Sunni Islamist extremists and they're Shia, uh, they don't get along. But nevertheless, right now, to get the U.S. under pressure is what Iran would like. So in that situation, what would Iran do? What would India do? What would China do? Because what would Russia do? Because all of them have a common interest, although they have been doing a bit of free riding, in my view, uh, over the last several years. They're all uh, 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 hostile to the to the to the to Islamic extremism because they have problems with groups who are extremists in their midst. You saw Chechnya with regard to Russia. Uh, you see Islamic, Uzbek Islamic forces that were part of Al Qaeda. Even you see the, uh, uh, the, the 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 Islamic forces in Chinese Central Asia, uh, Turkic and Islamic forces. India, of course, has a, has a has a vast problem with Pakistan and the terrorist Islamic forces that they face. One option that we may explore, in my view, and we haven't done that well, is to really internationalize this in a, a diplomatically in a way among big powers that could we work together vis-a-vis like, -vis Pakistan to shape its uh, future. We have tried to work ourselves with Pakistan alone and successfully. I think we need a kind of a Congress of Vienna style uh, when we think about dysfunctional Europe, uh, how uh, in the 19th, 18th century you had these sometimes big uh, uh, guys getting together to, to do a settlement. I think it's hard to reach an agreement with uh, some of the local players because of uh, lack of leveling. You know, they do and undo simultaneously and with regard to the same thing, uh, 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 that we need to have the more stronger and more powerful stakeholders come together uh, uh, or for an Afghan settlement, and then all of us, uh, using our relative advantage or disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis different regional players to work them. I think that this, 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 we may come to this, in my view, if our current effort to get a deal with the Taliban in Qatar uh, do, uh, does not succeed. So therefore, uh, what happens to Afghanistan uh, in, uh, 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 is affected by all that. But let's remember one thing. We went there not because we uh, were worried about Afghanistan as such. Uh, we went there because of Al-Qaeda attack. And uh, Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan uh, has been weak to very uh, non-existent since uh, close after we went in there. But they went to Pakistan, and they are under stress in Pakistan. They've lost a lot of, a lot of uh, their most important leaders. And uh, some of our intelligence people tell me, and policy people, that we may be on the verge of defeating uh, Al-Qaeda in Pakistan, the leadership there. Of course, several key leaders are still there, Zawahiri and others. But that we have, uh, through the uh, effective intelligence work and the use of, uh, of, of drones and, and other operations, have been, uh, have been uh, doing extremely well. So, Although Afghanistan looks in, 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 in more trouble, and if Afghanistan falters and the Taliban come back, and there is no agreement that they will not support terrorism again, and that agreement is, a, is not verifiable, as they say, and then one thing and do another, which has been their record, then uh, uh, the Al-Qaeda problem could grow uh, again. But at this point, that problem, which has been front and center that got us into this picture, we are in a better, uh, um, a significantly better place. Uh, 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 and, 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 and even if we leave Afghanistan, in my view, we would, we would continue to be focused on doing counter-terror operations as we do in some other parts of the world should that problem re-emerge. But for Afghanistan, the U.S. withdrawal will start another cycle of very 
uh, and uh, desirable from their point of view. Uh, another civil war, uh, regional powers coming, so that from their point of view and from a stability point of view, getting some sort of an agreement or hardening, a strategy of hardening succeeding are obviously much better. Let me turn to Iran, and I, I, I will say a little bit then after that to, to about the Arab Spring. Iran, the, the, the problem of Iran for us, really, from the United States perspective, is, uh, is, is right now twofold, strategically, besides what happens to Iran itself uh, from a democracy and human rights point of view. One is it, it's, it's, it's a nuclear program. And uh, uh, there is no question that the program has made great strides. Uh, and now, uh, there is a broad consensus uh, that uh, they are uh, within months, uh, I, mean, I, I think even the most conservative uh, uh, estimates are within a year, of producing one of the key elements for a weapon. The key, uh, there are three things you need for a, uh, for a weapon. I used to do actually nuclear issues before I got into regional politics uh, of these foreign policy issues. One is fissile material, uh, the, 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 the material that you need for a bomb. Uh, and uh, it's either uranium or plutonium. And Iran, uh, the, based on what one knows, is working the uranium option, uh, and that uh, they would have enough material with, from a few months to within a year for one or more uh, weapons. Uh, that's, that's a lot of progress, because the hardest part for getting to a, a weapon is the material. and, uh, and uh, uh, they, they are making good progress on that from their point of view. Second is the design of the bomb. Uh, uh, shaping the material, triggering mechanism. Uh, do you have a good design? Because the size of the bomb in terms of delivery uh, depends in part on your ability to, to, to have a good design and so forth. And they have been working it. Uh, IEA has said even in a October, a few months ago, report that they have good evidence that Iran has been working uh, uh, on the, the, the bomb design issue. Even during President Bush, the last uh, IEA report by our intelligence community that was public, although it said that Iran had stopped working on the bomb, if I remember that correctly, that was a very controversial NIE, as we uh, call it, uh, National Intelligence Estimate. And they did say that there had been some work done on triggering, uh, on the trigger and on the design. We, as a country, have a, a history where we have both overestimated and have underestimated uh, other countries' nuclear programs. Uh, we underestimated the Soviets. Uh, you know, they surprised us when they exploded the, the device. And we were further surprised when they went from nuclear to hydrogen bomb, much faster than we had anticipated. Uh, then we see, the, in the case of Iraq, we, in one country we've done both. We overestimated them the Gulf War, uh, uh, we underestimated them in the Gulf War uh, in 92, 91, 92, when we went for Kuwait, and afterwards we found out, wow, that all these things were going on in Iraq, and then we overestimated them in the Iraq War. We thought they had things that later on we found out they didn't. The reason I say that it's important that when we talk about intelligence, about where they are on the design, uh, that we may not be accurate, given uh, the, the record here. But there is, uh, I think, a general belief, and you remember about the belief that we had about Iraq, so, but nevertheless, general belief that there's work going on design. And then delivery systems. Uh, Depending on the size of the bomb, you can deliver it by an aircraft. We delivered our first bombs with aircraft, obviously. Uh, so uh, now, we have said this it would be unacceptable. Uh, a lot of other countries have said it would be unacceptable. If Iran is allowed to cross the threshold, have actually a nuclear weapons capability, that's one option. If it d demonstrates it and tests it, which I don't anticipate they will, uh, I, I, my own current estimate is they will not explode a device like Pakistan and India did. And they would want to be, get there for the foreseeable future not to test. But if they test, or if there is a 
essentially declaration, they have five bombs. Uh, if some IEA or some place says that. I think it will have a big impact given the, the, the Shia-Sunni rivalry that has become dominant in this region. That the Saudis, uh, even although the Turks have not said something different, some of the other states would want to also look at their options. It could be in terms of regional proliferation, uh, a significant development for further proliferation. And uh, given the vulnerability of the systems until they achieve maturity when you have survivable systems, multiple delivery systems, it could be uh, uh, that it would increase the chance of, uh, of nuclear conflict in that region. Although we can see the case of India and Pakistan, that hasn't happened. They've managed it so far, although the vulnerabilities are still there. But there would be an increased risk of that. Right now, of course, there is a great effort going on to pressure Iran not to continue on this path. Uh, the, the most recent sanctions uh, that includes uh, sanctions against the Iranian Central Bank, that includes uh, decisions not to buy Iranian oil, that uh, really, uh, if they are implemented as they are beginning to be implemented, uh, will, be, will have a big impact on the economy. Will Iran uh, come to the negotiating table, agree to have a civil nuclear program, but no military program, agree to have access to enriched material for its reactors from abroad without enriching it itself in Iran, or some other compromises that would give the world confidence that, that, that uh, a, an active nuclear weapons program is not being pursued. Or, despite the sanctions, is Iran so committed to a nuclear weapons capability because it believes that a country uh, of, 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 of status of Iran, or a country that is as much at risk as Iran is, because uh, one of the uh, uh, lessons learned of the first Gulf War that was done was by Iran, and it uh, concluded that if Iraq had had nuclear weapons, the U.S. would not have attacked it in the way that it did because of Kuwait. And so to avoid uh, uh, being attacked, you need to have uh, nuclear weapons was the implied lesson that they, that, uh, 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 that they drew their military leadership from that. W there is obviously a, a channel for negotiations. There is some proposal to meet again. Uh, economic uh, pressure usually has not been that effective uh, when countries have been determined because it takes a long time and a consensus to really be effective and usually you don't get consensus because some people make money for cheating because of cheating. So, and Iran has a commodity that people want. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, we talked about it earlier, one of its prime ministers, the father of Benazir Bhutto, was killed a few years ago, was prime minister at one time, said if India developed nuclear weapons, we'll develop it too, even if we have to eat grass. This was a, this is an actual s statement and a speech. They were so committed. We tried both positive and negative incentives to discourage them. We failed uh, because they were so committed. Now, the technology of nuclear weapons is not that. Uh, 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 difficult uh, that a country the size of Iran cannot master it, and they are mastering it. Uh, the question is the will, the decision to do it, and could uh, uh, the, the, the sanctions uh, affect it? We don't know. The guess is that they are very determined. We, we don't really know for sure because the will could change uh, depending on, on, on what the uh, cost estimates are. But the the other issue that I want to talk, the last issue uh, on this, is the uh, regional thing that connects Iran with the Arab Spring, and I will stop with that. The Arab Spring, uh, for people are asking uh, the question, is it good, is it bad, uh, so to speak, that these things have happened? I think they, 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 they had to happen, uh, because the systems that existed in the Arab world uh, it was not they were not producing uh, for the people. And the people, in terms of employment, in terms of freedom, in terms of democracy, 
And the people were getting more educated, more netted, and, uh, and, and, and uh, 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 the technologies of the current period was empowering them. Uh, Islam uh, has been empowered by the Arab Spring, which was inevitable, whether one likes it or not. The change was inevitable. And in my view, it could go in uh, the direction of, of Turkey, these Islamic parties. The Turkish ruling party is an Islamic party that I don't regard them as, a, as, 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 as uh, uh, a terrorist extremist party. I think uh, that they, we have had some issues with them on regional issues on, uh, uh, for example, their policy of competing with Iran for the Arab street and therefore trying to outmaneuver Iran on being more pro-Arab than the Iranians are, although the Turks historically have not been uh, 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 that pro-Arab, but, it's, but the, both Iran and Turkey are trying to be more Arab than the Arabs uh, because they want to win over the people to their side. They are competing for domination of the region, and Arab-Israel issue is one of the uh, cards that they are using. Uh, Neither is interested in going to war, in my view, with Israel. I mean, it's all very tactical uh, in, in, the, in the competition. Uh, and uh, right now, the, uh, the, 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 the Sunni, uh, the Islamist forces are inheriting a mess. Will they deliver to improve eco the economy? If not, what would be the alternative? Uh, are the more liberal forces getting organized? They were very good in demonstrating against the status quo, but they are not as good in coming together because uh, thousands of organizations came together for the overthrow, but two or three are going to compete to run the, a country, and they are not very good at that. They are signing book contracts in New York as to what each of the leaders of the various groups did uh, to bring about the change, uh, uh, and maybe as this evolves, uh, those forces could, be, could come uh, uh, together and we could help. But the regional effect is that the Arab uh, part, for the time being, is uh, very inward looking, weaker to play the geopolitical game uh, regionally. And it is Iran and Turkey that are, uh, uh, are, are trying to shape this. Right now, in, in Syria is the focal point of the, of the fight. The Iranians are pushing the Iraqis to give them access to cross their territory with weapons and other assistance to the regime. The Turks are pushing Iraqis not to do that. And Syria, how it goes, would shape the direction of the region. Because if Syria goes with the Sunni Islamists dominating it, Iran, the balance will shift decisively regionally against Iran. And Iraq, I think, is where ultimately this contest is going to come to. Uh, and that's why I personally, I don't know what, what some of you think, was not favorable to total U.S. withdrawal right now. I, I thought we should wait until the next Iraqi election to totally withdraw because we were a cushion, uh, a, a kind of uh, 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 a power that tried to keep things together, uh, help to keep things together. And, and uh, the pressures of the region is pulling things apart uh, right now. And Iraq, is, which is made up of Shia and Sunni and Kurd, is, is feeling the stress. Now, one last minute uh, to now go back uh, to, the, to the broader uh, picture. I think that we know that the rise of other powers that we talked about, China in particular, is getting our attention to shift towards an Asia-centered uh, strategy because uh, 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 the next big issues uh, as to when balance of power shifts between uh, big powers, that's a very uh, dangerous time if it's not managed well. To manage that rise of China and its integration well, perfectly, perfectly reasonable uh, 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 adjustment. But I believe that for the next 10 years, uh, as we work the China integration, what happens to this region on a day-to-day -day basis uh, will be uh, 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 what will draw people in. Uh, uh, insiders, of course, because this area, but also outside powers. And whether we can work a, a cooperative structure uh, from 
outsiders uh, to play a constructive role, or do we compete by s supporting uh, different sides, which will be as important, in my view, as, as uh, what the, the Shia Sunni uh, issues, uh, Iran, Turkey, and how the effort to build democratic order uh, uh, and the future of, of political Islam in terms of delivering on the key issues of the economic well-being, on the building uh, uh, institutions that serve the people and, and uh, uh, creates more opportunities for work, for people to, do, to lead productive lives, will, uh, will succeed. Uh, I think we, although as much as we may try to kind of get away from this region, as, because to some extent people are tired of it. I mean, because uh, we, uh, the, a lot of effort that made and sometimes you see not much progress. The requirements uh, and the, 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 the developments in this area will make that, uh, will make that very difficult. Uh, make it, in my view, and nearly impossible uh, not, to, not, to, not to remain engaged. And the question is, whether to engage or not is not the question. How do we uh, do the engagement in this coming phase? Well, thank you very much. I took too long. We look. Dean? Absolutely. The dean has instructed me that I should uh, be willing to take some questions. I'd be happy to do so. Comments are also welcome. Any uh, concerns? Constructive uh, uh, proposals, uh, <laughs> out of the box proposals to solve the problems of the region are most, be most welcome. Yes, sir. Well, here and then there. Please. Uh, could, could you talk about the role of Saudi Arabia in the context of your Sunni Shia analysis? Sure. Well, Saudi Arabia in the Sunni Shia. Uh, uh, world is uh, extremely important. Um, they uh, see themselves the custodian uh, of Sunni interests because they are the holy, two holy Islamic mosques uh, are in their territory. And they feel particular hostility to Iran as Iran in recent years has emerged as speaking on behalf of Islam, uh, rather than more than Saudi Arabia. And uh, they have been an advocate of an attack, uh, of, of attack by the United States against, uh, against uh, uh, Iran on the nuclear issue. Uh, so uh, they are uh, sentimentally and otherwise uh, important in the struggle. However, their ability to affect things, uh, they have some capability. They uh, financial. They have said, for example, uh, that if the sanctions now proposed vis-a-vis -vis Iran, including not to buy Iranian oil, if those produce shortages of oil in the consuming countries, they will compensate by increasing production, and they have the sp uh, significant spare capacity to produce more. Now, the Iranians have threatened them that uh, they would look uh, at such an act as a hostile act. Uh, but I think they would do that. My sense is they would do that. But they also they would want to keep the price of oil high enough to make, uh, to make, to make uh, money themselves. With regard to Arab Spring, uh, they have been uh, ambivalent to negative. Largely, they, uh, although they now they are trying to play to influence this direction, they were not happy about what happened to Egypt or what happened to President Mubarak. Uh, they were not happy about how we, the United States, dealt with uh, President Mubarak, a, a longtime ally and friend in their view of the United States. Uh, and uh, they obviously intervened in, uh, in Bahrain militarily where they could in the Gulf area adjacent to them to pr suppress the opposition there and help the king, the ruler of uh, Bahrain. And given that the oil prices are high and they can produce so much, they have put a lot of money to work inside Saudi Arabia uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, 
uh, avoid uh, uprisings uh, and unhappiness uh, uh, by the people evolve into uh, uh, a, 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 an active rebellion. Although in some parts of the country, there are the, have been demonstrations and some hostile activities, particularly in the Shia areas uh, of Saudi Arabia. And sometimes they blame the, uh, those activities on Iran or outsiders as such. On the Arab Spring, with regard to the Gulf, uh, uh, I think that although there is, it's different from country to country, my own judgment is that ultimately they have to evolve uh, probably to constitutional monarchies, uh, you know, not at the same time, at the same pace everywhere, ultimately, uh, 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 or they would face, in my judgment, uh, 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 unhappy people uh, organizing, perhaps differently in different places at different times, but uh, I think the, that that is coming uh, to that region too. So the more they can get ahead of it to avoid an Egyptian situation by evolutionary reform, which is not easy, and it's, there is always a fear that when you do reform, you unleash uh, forces that you may not be able to control, but if you don't reform, you make that for sure uh, that that will happen, although you risk some of uh, some un uh, instability if you if you take the lead in doing it. I understand the dilemma that they have and the challenge of this, but they are a they are a significant uh, significant player. Yes, sir. Um, Ambassador David Lip. Hey, David, nice to see you. Oh, my, I should have put my glasses on. <laughs> A great uh, uh, public servant for the United States in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, I, just a comment, I, I share your frustration at watching uh, Iraq seemingly unravel to the point that, that we, we saw at the depths of 2005, 2006. Let's hope that that doesn't happen. A question for you. Um, could you address the potential role of major foreign investment in Afghanistan and Iraq in helping to perhaps uh, solve some of the instability issues. We see both China and India investing significantly in sure. minerals in Afghanistan. Sure. And then in Iraq, obviously, the sure. oil sector. What, sure. what role could that well, be? Well, that's what I do right now, yeah. to encourage, uh, <laughs> to encourage uh, investment in both countries because uh, not only the economic development of these countries are important for their consolidation of the new order, because if the new order doesn't deliver, people uh, will uh, uh, lose faith in it uh, and uh, look at uh, for other models or other alternatives. Uh, but also uh, uh, because I want to, especially in regard to Afghanistan, lower the burden on the United States, because if they can generate more revenue themselves, uh, then uh, the U.S. doesn't have to uh, support them. Uh, as uh, In the case of Afghanistan, uh, the estimates are for f the foreseeable future, I think we would have to, uh, if we stay with it, have billions of dollars to sustain the security force that they need in order to deal with the problem. Although it would be cheaper than us doing it, but nevertheless, I think given the domestic needs, I c the politics of sustaining, paying, you know, eight, nine, ten billion dollars a year to sustain the Afghan forces is not going to be uh, compelling, perhaps, uh, uh, over time. Uh, so, in both countries, there are enormous potential. Certainly in Iraq, it's an obvious one. Everyone knows that Iraq is, uh, is quite rich with uh, in oil resources, uh, but they also have huge potential in gas. They have huge potential in agriculture because of water uh, and land issues. They have huge potential I used to say when I was there with David uh, that ultimately tourism, if they could get their act together and build a s <laughs> workable roads and, and be secure and, uh, uh, you know, the Garden of Eden is in, uh, <laughs> is in, uh, in, in Iraq. So it's, it, no part of Iraq is devoid of some great civilization having an impact on it that you would like to go and see. I certainly uh, wanted to do that. So. Uh, the West is active in the oil sector. We've had uh, uh, in Iraq, uh, the big oil companies, including Exxon Mobil, uh, Oxy, and a few others are there. There was a problem between the North and the South, and, uh, and we tried to get an oil law passed so that uh, 
there could be uh, cooperation. There is still that issue has not been resolved. The center blacklists companies that go to the north, although I think they're facing a real challenge with ExxonMobil because it's not a regular company. It's a huge company, and it's very important in the southern Iraq, and now they have signed up to go in the north. Uh, but I have to tell you, it's very hard, and I'm, as I said, I'm in this business, to get Western companies interested often. Uh, because it looks Iraq, oh, it looks uh, too risky, other than the oil companies. And they are used to oil companies. Major oil is used to working in difficult environments. Uh, you know, they, they've done it all their lives, so to speak. And, uh, you know, you, uh, look at Nigeria or Russia or wherever. So, uh, but uh, other Western companies are very difficult to get. The Iraqis, for example, I give a business tip to someone here who can do it. They would love to have McDonald's come and uh, franchise. <laughs> Now I tell them, is, are you sure you want to do this? To, uh, <laughs> but uh, McDonald's is opening, I understand, 400 franchisees a, a year or a month in China. They think Iraq is a, a little market. Uh, they are not, they, uh, to this day, they are, uh, they, are, they are not going. So many other companies that they are interested to have, not in Afghanistan, the mineral resources is one of the potential areas where they could be self-sustaining besides agriculture. And uh, there is an issue of corruption, of course, uh, there. Uh, the, uh, we have such draconian, by, by sort of from our point of view, not, but when you look at it by comparison to others, laws and rules about uh, foreign uh, corrupt practices, that, uh, that's one. Two, Afghanistan looks like, what? Are you, are you crazy? A private companies, owned company shareholders saying, I'm going to go invest in Afghanistan. Uh, they would want terms uh, that we can't compete effectively with the Indians and the Chinese. And three, I have to say that our government is not uh, as well organized and as pushing of U.S. economic interests in this sort of things as we could be. We were uh, at one point very good at this. That's what we did. Our foreign policy was essentially opening markets, and uh, but now uh, we don't do that uh, that well. In fact. Some of these bits that David talked about, like the Chinese getting the oil concessions in northern Afghanistan, and the, 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 the whole bidding process was, was run by U.S. advisors funded by the Pentagon. Uh, uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, and I have to say some of the leaders during the time that I worked would instruct me specifically not to push too hard for U.S economic interest. I won't name names, but they will say because it will look like we went there for, for oil, and which was one of the allegations anyway that we had gone there. But I think given where we're going, uh, and I will, I'll end with that because the dean is getting up, um, <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, given our own economic circumstances, we need to, to do a much better job to, to, to promoting economic interests uh, uh, than we have been doing in recent times. Uh, 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 I'm talking uh, the government, Congress, and others, because we're not as effective as we used to be uh, in this. And maybe when we were doing very well, uh, this was not important. But I think now, it, it, once again, it will become more important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Thanks to everyone for coming this evening. Have a good evening. Thanks so much.